Welcome to the Continuing Med Medical Education uh, Pain Management Series. Uh, we will be discussing Pain Physical Therapy 101 today in this virtual lecture. Uh, my name is Corinne Cooley. I will be one of the presenters today. Uh, my background is in orthopedic and sports medicine, as well as uh, pain management. Um, I've been working with the Stanford, Stanford Pain Management Center for about six years now and been a part of developing our interdisciplinary groups and programs for patients that have chronic pain. Um, and my co-presenter today is Matt Wright. I'll let him introduce himself. Yeah, thanks, Corinne. Um, as Corinne said, my name is Matt Wright. Um, I'm also uh, one of the other physical therapists here on, on staff uh, in the Stanford Pain Management Center. Uh, I came on staff here about a year ago um, after completing a residency uh, here at Stanford as well in orthopedics. Uh, I think really my passion uh, lies mostly within pain management, which is uh, the reason for my transition. Um, fun little tidbit was that back uh, a while ago when I was a student, Corinne actually served as uh, my uh, clinical instructor. So it's uh, fun to uh, have the opportunity to present uh, a lecture with her um, now, uh, both as colleagues. So I'm excited about today's presentation. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, you guys learn a, bit, a, a little bit more about uh, what pain physical therapy is. So our objectives for uh, this lecture are going to describe the role of physical therapy in a multidisciplinary pain management clinic. Um, we're also going to identify the difference between common pain physical therapy interventions or what we do with our patients from a traditional orthopedic and sports medicine uh, physical therapy clinic. Um, we're also going to cover uh, common obstacles that patients often report um, when they in chronic pain when initiating an exercise or an activity program. Um, so this is more for uh, maybe physicians or medical providers that maybe aren't in an in interdisciplinary clinic, but are certainly still working with um, patients that are struggling with chronic pain, and also recognizing the key exercise as a key coping strategy uh, as in addition to other non-pharmacological management strategies that are covered in the other portions of this pain management module. So we know that um, pain is a very common reason to seek medical care. The annual incidence of low back pain and neck pain ranges from is 20% of the population in, in globally. And within the United States, one in five or 20% of people um, in a study done uh, in 2016 showed that the people are experiencing chronic pain. Uh, in interestingly, is that 8% of that uh, population is experiencing what we call high impact chronic pain, where it's affecting their work activities and their and high impact on their quality of life. So it's very common for uh, patients to come in with various pain conditions, back pain, neck pain, um, as well as um, persistent pain. Just because people are coming in in pain, it's important for us to remember that they are more than just their body part. So evidence shows that when uh, patients present to their primary care physician and they have low back pain, over half of them um, have high fear of further re-injury or persistent back pain. 30% um, to 50% show signs of depression. Um, and then half uh, show elevated fear of physical work or return to work. Uh, and um, one fifth, so 20% are um, high risk for further, um, for poor outcomes or not returning to work or having persistent pain based on psychosocial factors. So even though they're coming in with a specific body part that might be the pain issue, it's important to remember that uh, there's more than just their body that makes up their pain experience. And that's that's what we're going to be discussing a lot today. So what is pain physical therapy? Um, this is a nice little overview of what we're going to cover today. We're going to cover pain neuroscience education. So this is an educational intervention that's been studied in various randomized control trials. Um, specifically going over hurt versus harm or that pay, the pain experience is not always correlated to tissue damage. Uh, we're also going to look at addressing fear avoidance and the fear avoidance cycle. 
uh, pain physical therapy often uses active interventions with the key message that exercise is restorative. And we'll go over some of the research behind that uh, later in the slides. And, and another goal is to improve tissue tolerance or activity tolerance so that patients can have a better quality of life and get back to whatever they'd like to do, walk longer, garden longer, socialize, um, and then certainly covering self-management and pain coping tools so they don't feel like they need to rely on a, a provider to help reduce their pain, but that they've got tools that they can use on their own um, if they have a flare-up or certainly um, at home to just take care of themselves. So here's a list. Um, this, this table is kind of for your resource here to compare the typical ortho sport physical therapy visit versus a pain physical therapy visit. And so you can see here that the duration in the initial visit is longer from an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. Make sure to give it a very detailed history uh, list of things that patients may have already done that they're not interested in exploring you, here. Use motivational interviewing techniques is very routine when we're working with people that have chronic pain um, to assess how much how much willingness they would like to start new behavioral goals. Um, again, uh, manual interventions are less commonly used, um, may precede an active approach, but not as routine as the ortho sport uh, physical therapy. Active interventions, what we mean is like exercise um, uh, or or you know, therapeutic activities, uh, passive modalities might be something like ice, TENS, ultrasound. Those are less common, um, at least in the session, uh, or rare um, with, with a pain physical therapy visit. Again, fear avoidance education is common. The pain neuroscience education is common. Often we're working with an interdisciplinary team. So the pain psychologists, the pain physicians, nursing staff, um, or a complex care case manager uh, as well. And then we, we also use graded exposure to exercise, which is a fear-based exercise um, intervention and often um, assist in opioid reduction plans. So a tapering plan and making sure that their uh, non-pharmacological tools are um, in, increased dur during that time. All right. Um, so what is pain neuroscience education? You know, this is a, um intervention that Corinne had already uh, kind of touched on briefly. And this is an intervention that we use commonly within the clinic. Um, a lot of my time uh, with patients is actually spent um, educating the patient on uh, the pain process, what pain is actually telling them. And our, our, our hope is that uh, patients kind of walk away from the session uh, with a, a better understanding. Oftentimes you'd be surprised that one's understanding of pain might not actually be in tune with the current literature that's out there. And they're under that it's, it's poorly influencing their behaviors. They are resting as a result. They're avoiding things a little bit more. They are not seeking kind of restorative practices to get back to functional activity. So it could actually impact them uh, in a great way. And so we'll go over that a little bit today. Um, one of the key themes within uh, pain neuroscience education is that we uh, make a distinction between uh, nociception and pain. Uh, nociception being the um, kind of the high threshold process um, where nociceptors are activated uh, kind of along the periphery of one's body. And uh, from that point, those signals are then sent up through the spinal cord and then to the brain. But it's ultimately the brain that is making sense of these signals and uh, producing a pain output. Uh, there are individuals that have pain that have um, kind of these ongoing nociceptive processes. There are also people too with, uh, with a lot of pain and they, they might not have a significant nociceptive process that's happening along the periphery. They might have more of a centralized process that's happening at the level of the spinal cord or the brain. So uh, we do our best through pain neuroscience education to uh, make sense of that for the patient because this can often be a complicated uh, topic. Uh, an, another thing uh, that we want to really make sure a patient understands is that uh, pain is meant to be a protective mechanism. It is not always an indicator of tissue damage. Sometimes it is. Uh, for instance, if someone uh, steps off the curb and rolls their ankle, um, pain's a good thing in that, in that instance because we want to actually protect that tissue, especially if it was compromised and if you had a high-grade grade sprain or something of the sort. Um, but 
it is not always an indicator of tissue damage. And especially for individuals who have persistent pain, it becomes less and less an indicator of tissue damage. One common, um, common metaphor that I uh, will oftentimes use with patients is that uh, pain is similar to an alarm. I kind of liken pain to a car alarm, for instance. Uh, you can imagine that a car alarm is, would typically go off if someone were to break through the glass, and that's an appropriate use of the car alarm, similar to our body's alarm, pain, when, say, we step off that curb and roll, over, roll our ankle. Uh, but at the same time, too, uh, car alarms don't only go off when, um, when someone breaks into the glass. Uh, they can also go off with, like, a large gust of wind, uh, or a loud car that drives by it. And in that case, the car alarm is a little bit extra sensitive. And the same thing can happen with pain. Um, our, body's pain our, our body's alarm system can go off without a process that is actually damaging to it. So again, with pain neuroscience education, our, our goal is really to help these patients make sense of it because when they do make sense of the pain process, their, um, their behaviors around the pain process is actually going to change. Within pain physical therapy, uh, we often use a unique set of a, uh, clinical measures that you might not commonly see being used uh, within a traditional orthopedic setting. Um, some common measures that we use include the uh, fear avoidance beliefs questionnaire, the Tampel scale of kinesiophobia, where we're actually measuring uh, one's kind of avoidance or fear of movements. Um, also to the pain catastrophizing scale, and the chronic pain acceptance questionnaire. Uh, I think that these are really helpful clinical measures to use and especially uh, kind of getting this data before someone actually walks in the door. It helps inform me uh, and Corinne also too as a clinician uh, to kind of what uh, maybe the, the patient's preconceived notions are uh, when they're coming in, where they're at exactly from like a psychosocial standpoint. Um, so we certainly will use these and they certainly uh, help inform kind of our decision making, especially as we're going through an evaluation. All right, and as Corinne mentioned, um, there are certainly a number of studies out there um, that have looked at pain neuroscience education over the years, especially within the last decade. Here we have listed just a few systematic reviews that have kind of taken a look at pain neuroscience education to see what their, the impact of it is. There's actually a little bit of evidence that pain neuroscience education is helpful in terms of uh, reducing one's pain, uh, but also really where I think the pain neuroscience education shines is that it helps increase uh, individual's function, uh, decrease unhelpful thoughts, improve self-efficacy, and then also to reduce that any sort of fear of movement. So within pain physical therapy, uh, we certainly have our fair share of obstacles, okay? As I had mentioned uh, earlier, uh, patients can come into the clinic and they can have a whole history of beliefs about pain, what it is, about tissue damage. Many of the individuals that we see, they can maybe have had pain for 20 or 30 years. And they've had kind of a, uh, they've kind of conceptualized their pain in a certain way. Uh, and it might not actually um, be consistent with the current evidence that is out there. That being said, um, we, we certainly don't want to undercut them the first visit. We want them to come back. Um, but we, we do our best to uh, explain what pain is and, again, what it's trying to communicate um, to us uh, in, in our bodies. Okay? A lot of patients, too, they've had failed experiences with physical therapy. So their expectations when they come to pain physical therapy are actually fairly low. We know that when expectations for an intervention are low, the likelihood of them actually being effective um, are going to be less. So really, when... When I see a patient, when I have a patient that's in front of me and they come in with that past failed experience and a poor expectation of physical therapy, I, I, I do my best to make them see why this might be different and how we might be able to take a different approach just to ensure that they, they aren't going down the same exact road that they've gone down before. For instance, you could have someone who's had a long history of low back pain and they've said that they've done all the core exercises in the world. Um, they do massage, they do foam rolling and this and that, and they're expecting to just get the same thing because they've been to multiple physical therapists in the past who have done core strengthening. And I might take a totally different approach. Core strengthening isn't always the answer. Um, and certainly if they've done it multiple times and they've had a poor experience with it, we're definitely going to be uh, doing something else. Okay. And for, uh, for individuals too, who, um, are reliant on uh, medical interventions uh, to control their pain. 
really my hope is that we can overcome that obstacle and maybe we can discuss some non-pharmacological treatment strategies um, when it comes to, I know that Corinne's gonna be going uh, over that a little bit more later on in our presentation today, um, but that's certainly an obstacle that we might have to overcome uh, with our patients. And then lastly, I would say that, you know, a lot of these individuals, they've, they've had pain for many, many years. They go from doctor visit to doctor visit um, with very little hope sometimes for the future. Um, and our role as therapists is uh, really to kind of get at the, um, to, to, to try to understand what's meaningful and valuable to them and hopefully bring that out so that they, uh, that they know that that's actually probably something that they can work towards. Uh, if it's that the person's staying at home all the time, they just can't go out, they miss spending time with their grandkids. Uh, I'd want to ensure that our goals um, when we're doing physical therapy, that really anything that we're doing in physical therapy is targeted to meet those goals, whatever they are, so that we can improve their overall quality of life. Okay, one of the things that um, I'm actually pretty passionate about is um, language that we use, language that we use with our patients. Um, I think that a lot of this goes unnoticed by uh, clinicians of all sorts, and it's certainly something that um, I have had to work on over the years and I still continue to work on over the years. Um, but as I, as I, especially as I've started to see more of the population uh, with persistent pain, I have seen um, the impact of language on these, uh, these individuals. You know, these, these people, they carry what their doctors and what their, phys uh, excuse me, what their doctors, providers, chiropractors, physical therapists have, have told them over the years. Um, they, they are meaningful, our words. So I think it's important that we are just mindful of that and that we are trying to use patient-friendly language. Um, right here, I have an example and kind of, of uh, something that you might actually hear that I've certainly heard a patient tell me before. Um, it, it basically, the, the quote would go something along the lines of, the body's like a machine. Um, like this would be like when a, uh, a physician is describing the uh, imaging changes to them um, that they've seen on, like on a, a radiology report. Anyways, the, the physician might say that the body's like a machine. Uh, the bone on bone changes that you see on the scan here is just like a car that needs its brake pads replaced from years of wear and tear. I think really that gives the, um, the patient the idea that the body just gets broken down over time and that because of old age, there really is less and less hope. Um, so I, I think that has act, actually has an influence on how they behave and how they interact with their pain. Um, that runs contrary to the second example, which would be a little bit more patient friendly, that would say something along the lines of, uh, we were actually able to, to visualize some changes on the x-ray. However, these changes are, are quite common, even among asymptomatic populations. Uh, you can imagine these uh, changes as wrinkles on the inside. Okay, there's a lot of literature out there that has shown um, sort of like degenerative changes amongst asymptomatic populations. Okay, about 80% of individuals who are 50 and older have some form of disc degeneration in their back, but they don't even know it. So if that's the case, um, is this really a pathological process or is this something more along the lines of wrinkles on the inside? You know, just as we wouldn't imagine that our outside appearance would be the same as it was 30 years ago. Maybe the inside appearance shouldn't be expected to say the same as well. So I think that it's important that we bring that awareness to our patients and that when we are describing things that we are uh, describing things that aren't necessarily breaking them down, uh, but actually building them up. Here are just a few more examples uh, of some common uh, words and language that we hear. Uh, things like bone on bone, degenerative changes, wear and, cha wear and tear, excuse me, uh, instability or unstable. You know, I, I've had patients that feel that their, their back is actually like a, a pile of blocks about ready to break at any given moment that is just unstable. Um, also, too, using language like pinched and damage. Okay, if someone hears that they have like a degenerative disc, um, it goes through their head that's not going to actually get better. And that's something that they place on themselves. And I, I think that there are alternatives to our language that we can certainly use, okay, that might be a little bit more helpful for them and be uh, more restorative. Some of those alternatives might be like narrowing in place of bone on bone. 
um, instead of degenerative changes, normal age-related changes, same thing with wear and tear, normal age-related changes instead. Instead of something saying something like instability or unstable, uh, you might say, well, maybe the back just needs a little bit more strength and control, okay? Um, instead of something being pinched, maybe it's just tight. So just consider that when we're speaking. To, we, we're, my hope would be that we all really consider uh, the language that we're um, speaking to our patients so that when they walk away from the, the session, they don't walk away from the session feeling like they have a hundred more things wrong with them uh, than what they came in with. I mean, I think really in conclusion of this, um, I think it's just important to note that our words matter and our words do have an impact on patients. They influence their perception and their behavior uh, around pain. Um, also too, something that's important to notice is that words can be passed uh, across generations. Um, so someone can, someone's grandma could have a doctor that tells them one thing and that they, 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 they have kind of a, um, they, they see their grandma go through this process and that kind of gets passed on uh, to them through generations. So it's important, again, just coming back to it, that our, our, our words do matter. So should, we should definitely be really mindful of that. And certainly, Matt, one of the things that we also remind our patients is that we want them to consider the language that they use with themselves, not only the provider's language, but when the patient is coming in, right. challenging their own conceptions. And the reason for that is in pain physical therapy, we want to provide an environment, right, where the patient can embrace all aspects of the biopsychosocial models. So their thoughts, their history, their you know, genetics, their, um, their uh, outside influences, as well as their internal structure and to overcome their pain. And that could be something as their internal language and how they're speaking to themselves. Um, so uh, that's just something that we will address in our visits. If someone's continuing to say, oh yeah, my, my worn out knee, and I'll be like, oh, that's maybe the knee that needs a little bit more strength or the knee that's going to need a little bit more exercise to, to help you get through this right now. So recognizing fear avoidance is one of the um, big things that we try to work on in physical therapy, um, specifically pain physical therapy. And an example of this um, could be that the patient in initially right, has an injury or their pain starts and uh, their pain starts in what they notice is that if they stop an activity, it actually helps. And that makes sense, right? You roll your ankle, you get a sprained ankle and it swells up. You don't go run on it the next day. Uh, you wait until the swelling goes down and gets back to it. However, um, that would be the green side of this, uh, 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 this recovery approach, right? They get back, they start loading it again, and then they're back to running. Um, However, that's not really what happens when, by the time someone has seen us, right, and they've failed regular physical therapy, usually what's happened is they've um, stopped moving. And then when they tried to move again, their pain was, experience was actually worse. And this could be from deconditioning, avoidance, or high fear of re-injury, guarding, right, maybe they're moving differently, or could just be part of the biological processes like sensitization. Um, but that continued avoidance will um, lead to mood changes, right? Maybe higher, we'd call it pain catastrophizing or worrying about their pain, which therefore increases their pain um, and leads to continued avoidance. This would be the red or the vicious si side of the cycle. Um, and usually when we see them, they're still in this red vicious side of the cycle and they've tried you know, pushing through, but then their pain gets worse and they had to rest longer. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the boom bust cycle later. Um, however, it's important that, you know, we, that the patient starts to recognize that they're in this cycle because often they'll be in the cycle and they don't even recognize um, that they're in it, except that they're stuck. They feel stuck. And that's the words they'll say, I feel stuck and I can't make any progress. Um, and they don't recognize that they're kind of stuck on this vicious cycle. Uh, once we kind of explain to them, hey, you, you, there's this other side of the cycle and we're going to help you get to it, right? That's really opening up their hope, um, their realization that, that they can do something to help get back 
back in that green, the green cycle back to their activities. Um, and, and really using the words fear or concern, kind of get, using their own language about what they're worried about in their bodies in terms of damage and really bolstering um, their confidence and like, hey, you know, you're, you, there are things that you can do that is safe. And that's our job as the physical therapist to f- find out what amount of tissue loading and educate them on what is safe and what actually might be restorative for them. So considering pain not as a marker of injury, but as a human, ex- as human experience should not be an alternative or niche therapy, but the very thing that unites us. So we work together, and um, this is Patrick Wall, one of the prominent pain researchers. Um, and, and so looking at as pain physical therapists, right? We want to work together with other providers and the patient and understand them that we are here to help them with their pain um, rather than just um, just to their, their body, but their pain as a whole. So moving on to movement. Uh, oftentimes, one of the common beliefs is that movement or exercise or activity is harmful um, because it increases pain or it has increased a patient's pain in the past. And so we really want to explore that movement is, is more of restorative, is helpful. The research supports that. And we're going to talk a little bit that later in the, in the slides here. And then what amount of movement is recommended uh, it, once they've kind of improved their activity tolerance. So um, in terms of people with chronic pain, the NIH, the National Institute of Health, recommends 150 minutes of moderate to intensity aerobic exercise a week, and then also muscle strengthening twice a week. Now, when patients are coming in, I don't tell them these numbers. Um, I usually say, okay, well, what are you doing now? They're like, oh, I can't do even 15 minutes. You know, we'll talk about maybe five minutes as you're starting and understanding that even five minutes is still beneficial for their health and will help them move towards, right, that using aerobic exercise or strengthening as a coping tool and improving their function rather than um, a pain flare. So exercise reduces pain. Uh, We've studied runners uh, since the 1980s, um, found that 85% VO2 max reduced um, ischemic pain thresholds and improved mood, joy, euphoria, and cooperation. Uh, And then since then, many studies have have demonstrated over time that, again, exercise um, releases endorphins, it helps improve mood. Um, And that uh, in 2002, they also looked at not just 85% VO2 max, but something as little as 50 to 70% uh, VO2 max with only 10 to 30 minutes at a time. Doesn't have to be running, it could be cycling, uh, walking, briskly, swimming, and that again, increased pain inhibition. So reduced uh, that pain pressure threshold. And then looking at, again, some more evidence on exercise-induced hypoalgesia, we'll talk with our patients about the benefits of exercise, that it does modulate pain. And there are many mechanisms that they're looking at. Uh, Again, I mentioned the endorphins and um, the opioid receptors. However, recent research um, also shows that there's independent activation of cannabinoid receptors and uh, reduction in activated microglia and um, certainly uh, mood effects. So we're still studying all the different uh, factors that can influence the exercise hypoalgesic response, but just knowing it's there and kind of reminding the patient there that uh, exercise is um, hypoalgesic or reduces pain. In terms of prescribing exercise, there's a lot of research that uh, shows that you can prescribe exercise across various diseases or conditions. Um, This is a study uh, that was done in 2012 and has been redone uh, uh, since then, another review, but psychiatric conditions, neurological conditions, cardiovascular, pulmonary conditions, uh, prevention of cancer, and then of course, musculoskeletal conditions. So again, often the patient might have some conceptions of, oh, you know, movement is worse for my joints, it's going to inflame them, and, and really kind of taking some time to educate them on uh, that there is movement that is safe to do and, and restorative. So looking at chronic pain, there have been studies on uh, resistance training with osteoarthritis um, compared to NSAIDs. 
uh, acupuncture, as well as intra-articular corticosteroid injections. And again, they found that exercise is comparable or better. Um, so just kind of reminding patients that, hey, if you're taking that medication, you could use exercise as an alternative. Um, and then there was a review trial of persistent low back pain, pain showing that uh, exercise therapy has a clinically important at least 20% effect and reduce functional limitations. So, you know, you're looking for what kind of tools can we use to help bring that number down uh, so you can be more functional um, and you can participate in your life again. And 20% can be a, a, a very meaningful change for patients. Um, we also know that exercise programs can reduce reliance on medications. So there's a, a variety of studies that have shown this, but um, animal studies specifically showed decreased self-administration of morphine, uh, as well as human studies in non-chronic pain reduce um, medication cravings or cannabis use, or uh, long-term opioid therapies found that engaging exercise programs was helpful in reducing cravings and improving quality of life. And then for muscular skeletal pain, there was a very large study looking at uh, patients that received initial phys early physical therapy after surgery, uh, reduced their opioid use by uh, 10%, and then de decreased their risk of even starting on opioid medication. So just looking at exercise is key and certainly better um, initiated sooner uh, when possible rather than later. Uh, next, we'll talk about... Um... Activity pacing. Activity pacing is a, uh, a number, uh, excuse me, another uh, intervention that we commonly use in the clinic. Um, you know, there's going to be a spectrum of individuals that walk into our door. There are going to be those that are on the more of the avoidance um, end of things where they're not doing um, a lot of activities and they're avoiding and kind of getting stuck in that fear avoidance loop, uh, as Corinne had explained earlier. And then on the other end, you're going to be seeing those persisters those that just keep kind of pressing and pressing and pressing and pressing in. And those are the individuals that we're really going to be using a lot of activity pacing uh, with. Really activity pacing is just breaking the activity down uh, into smaller pieces of time and kind of um, using their symptoms as a, or, or excuse me, instead of using their symptoms as like a resting point. Okay. So what that basically means is instead of say, if someone likes to garden, instead of gardening all day long, and going until they're just totally wiped out, it would be actually, okay, say, hey, you know what, maybe you can garden in the morning for 30 minutes, stop actually before you get to the point where you feel bad, and then you can maybe resume, have another interval of gardening later on in the day. And really the idea behind this, um, our hope is that these individuals can still participate in their valued activities, um, However, without the point of getting into like a pain flare as a result of engaging in that activity. Now, uh, graded exercise is also something that we're going to be doing on, on, a, on a really regular basis. Really, any sort of exercise program should be kind of uh, building on top of each other. We might start low, depending on what the patient's result for exercise. Uh, we'd like to consider maybe about a 10% increase um, in terms of intensity on a weekly basis, okay? So for instance, if the patient had like a running goal and say that they found that their threshold was running for 15 minutes, okay, well, we can work there and then maybe add a minute, possibly two um, each week there following, okay? And the idea of that is just that going and exercise in a graded fashion uh, would build up greater activity tolerance over time. Now, for those individuals that are on more of the avoidant end of the spectrum, we might need to use something like graded exposure as it relates to movement, okay? Someone may have had an injury when they were bending over to pick something up, and they have tried to keep their back as straight as possible for years on end because they were told that bending or flexing their spine uh, might actually uh, increase their risk of another disc bulge down the road. Okay, someone like that, you'd understand where they're coming from. Obviously, they had this kind of traumatic experience and they don't want to go down that road again. So they are doing their best to avoid any of that. So they might be bending down to pick things up um, using like only their knees, keeping their back straight up. But actually, what we began to understand is that a little bit of lumbar flexion isn't actually or doesn't actually predispose one 
to future cases of pain. So we might actually work on bending forward a little bit. However, doing so in a graded fashion as well. And obviously, and also too here, the goal behind this is to improve their activity tolerance and, and also to get them and get them to a point where the, those motions are um, being restored that were once lost. So, um, you know, for individuals, um, again, here we have kind of the, uh, the persistence and avoider descriptions, um, and again, the couple ends of the spectrum. For those, um, for those persisters, oftentimes, what you might see is that, especially on a good day, they're just going to say, you know what, hey, I've had a good day today, I'm feeling good, I'm going to do my activities, I'm going to do a bunch of household chores, I'm going to go uh, run some errands, I might go engage in a couple uh, recreational activities that I really enjoy and they do so much work on their good day but then the next day and probably multiple days following they kind of have a pain flare okay and they get in this bus cycle. Uh, really the goal between activity pacing is to avoid this bus cycle the boom bus cycle okay. Uh, we want uh, the patients to probably experience something a little bit more towards the middle here Okay, where even on those good days, they are just limiting things to the extent that they can actually tolerate so that the uh, few days afterwards, they can still engage functionally. Okay, we wouldn't want them to have one good day and then a week full of bad days until they repeat that cycle again the next week. Okay, so the idea behind, again, activity pacing is hopefully we can get them to the point um, where they aren't having these big busts or flare ups. Okay, but uh, along with activity pacing and graded exercise exposure, our hope would be that their intervals and their tolerance over time would actually improve the more and more they do things. So one so. thing that we can do for activity pacing um, that Matt had mentioned that's so key is using time. And so time-based pacing is where they want to, uh, you want to use that instead of their pain. And so often, Matt mentioned the person who will push and push and push and then until their pain is high. Uh, they're flared up for days, weeks, and then their end up their total time lost for the activity might be two days when all they tried to do was garden for a few hours. And so what we want to do is use as a timer below when their pain intensity is high for maybe for 10 or 15 minutes, 30 minutes before they get symptoms. And then they don't have that crash so that there isn't that big loss. Um, so using time can be a very helpful guide here. And certainly what you can query your patients on, how are you doing your activities? Do you, you know, do you just go into, you know, you, you crash or are you using something to help you um, stay consistent here and build up? Yeah, you know, Corinne, one, one metaphor that I actually like to use with patients too um, as it pertains to this very thing, is I, I liken their, uh, their exercise dosage to like the dosage that the patient might receive with a particular type of medication, okay? Not, not everyone is prescribed the highest dose at first, okay? Oftentimes, physicians will ramp up the dosage over time um, just to ensure that the patient can tolerate the dose. And the same thing would apply to physical therapy or exercise or activity, um, we start a little bit lower and then gradually over time, we will uh, ramp things back up. So this is just an example of a specific activity plan, plan, plan that you can use that we made for your reference here. So the example would be a patient wa uh, wants to walk longer with their, their uh, partner. And so they would like to walk for 30 minutes, but every time they go for 30 minutes, they have to rest for an hour after that. Okay, so that is that seems like a long time. It's a whole hour and a half to to take up that that time, and so what you might say is, okay, well, I want you to walk for ten minutes uh, with ten minutes of rest, and then do that three times or spread throughout your day. Um, and so the total walking time is thirty ten minutes, and then the rest time you don't have that hour crash afterwards. So it's actually more efficient, and then you're still building your base right for conditioning, but not getting that pain flare. Um, key components of activity pacing are establishing a baseline. This is where um, pa sometimes pa patients need a little bit more guidance. And then the second po component is providing positive reinforcement. <laughs> so making sure you reward them or, or encourage them. Good job on starting your activity pacing. And then focusing on their goals. If they want to increase their time or their endurance, that might make one plan. Uh, increasing the number of cycles could be another way. Or if they're thinking, oh, I want to improve or decrease my rest time and make my individual walking time longer, you could 
increase the individual minutes. And, and we'll go into later about fit principles of like time and duration. Um, but just knowing that there's a, you're, you really want to ask what the patient's working on and focus their goals to them um, so that they are continue to be motivated, even if they have, um, they might struggle with some of the increase. And you can see these increases here aren't going to be large jumps so that they're kind of limiting, uh, they won't, they're less likely to experience a pain flare. Okay, so choosing an exercise dose. Uh, this is one where they actually did a very large study looking at people with chronic pain at the FIT principles. So we'd say the frequency, the intensity, the time, and then the duration. Uh, and looking at, okay, if you're going to choose an exercise for someone that's experiencing chronic pain, uh, what dose can you get the best benefit for pain reduction. And what they found is that the frequency or the number of times performed per week going from like once a week or to, you know, up to six times a week was where if you increase that, you're going to have the largest impact on pain. So usually um, if I'm trying to get someone to start an exercise program, I might start it one or twice a week just so they get committed and, and consistent and confident. And then building up that frequency would be one way to in increase. Um, but certainly the intensity is another way you can increase the dose. Um, I usually don't increase intensity unless that's their specific goal. And then the time and minutes can be increased as well. And the duration of weeks. Um, they did find a good effect for pain for the time and minutes, but the duration in weeks, um, they didn't really find a, a big effect if, okay, if they did their exercise program for four weeks versus six weeks versus 12 weeks. Um, so that's uh, less of an um, emphasis that I'll, I'll hit with patients. Um, so just knowing that can be helpful when you're trying to decide which, which way to go with increasing your exercise program there. And then looking at resistance exercise for chronic pain, um, the frequency, again, the recommendation is two to three times a week for someone that's having chronic pain. Um, usually I use the RPE scale. Um, in the clinic, you can use 40% or 60% or 70% one rep max. That's the maximum they can do for only one, one repetition and they can't do a second. However, you know, if you're working with someone in telehealth or you don't have access to weights, then you can use the RPE scale instead. Um, that's the rate of perceived exertion. Uh, so we, we, can, we have another thing on rate of perceived exertion on the next slide, but that's one way to gauge if it's intense or not. And then building sets and reps over time. It's important to remember that uh, if you are going to increase load, right, sets or reps, you're only going to do one at the time um, so that you're not um, increasing like the amount of weight. So from 10 pounds to 15 pounds, going from 10 reps to 20 reps in, in the same, um, in, in one week, essentially at the same time. One thing that I have on here is this tachometer on the side. And the reason I put that on there is to remind patients that if you are starting a resistance exercise program, you are going to have an increase in at least muscular pain um, or muscular sensation or soreness. And so moving into this, I tell, remind patients like, hey, this is like a car engine. You're going to ramp the engine up a little bit, but you shouldn't be hanging out with the, with the engine revved the entire time at like a six, seven, eight on this little tachometer. You're going to go up a little bit during the exercise. And then when you stop the exercise, that sensations of muscle contraction action, soreness, it should, it should diminish pretty quickly. There's kind of a reminder of like, again, what's safe and what is it to expect during um, a resistance exercise program? Yeah, no, I think it's important to, especially with our patients, uh, that we kind of set expectations, um, especially around exercise, you know, um, that they, they might have a, a day of a couple days of some muscular soreness, but that's actually okay and expected. And if that expectation is set early on, I think that that will give them a little bit more buy-in too uh, when they do go to experience it. Like, Hey, you know what, actually this, Oh, this is what my therapist said I was supposed to expect. Okay. This will get better with time. The more that I do it. And that's also too, something that we see in the clinic all the time and is consistent with the literature as well. But the more that you will do something, um, the less sore that you will be over time. You will have less of that delayed onset muscle soreness. Um, but again, like with everything else, I think it's just important that you kind of ramp things up gradually. Um, so again, that the patient doesn't necessarily experience like a flare up or anything like that. 
And then looking at aerobic exercise, um, again, these are, these are some published guidelines for people that have pain. So at least two times a week, but the, you'd want to build up to five times a week. Again, I have this RPE scale here on the right-hand side where you can see the six on the rate of perceived exertion you could describe as very, very light, kind of like you're sitting here listening to the lecture. Uh, and then 20 would be very, very hard max is exertion, sprinting, or, you know, if you imagine someone doing jumps and jumps and jumps um, so until you're breathless. Um, so what we would recommend is, you know, low RPE, eight to 10, very light would be, you know, 45, 40 to 40, 55% heart rate max. So it correlates well with heart rate. Um, moderate might be 55 to 70% of heart rate max. And then that high 70 to 90% of heart rate max. And again, the research shows they only need to be working low to get that analgesic benefit. Uh, or pain reduction. Time would be if you have someone that's exercise impaired, like a low exercise tolerance, less than 20 minutes, you're probably going to start with more of a graded uh, activity pacing approach. And then once you hit that 20 minutes, you can really use graded exercise to build up to 60 minutes or the, what the recommendations are for um, general health. Certainly progression considerations are make sure that when you're looking at duration and intensity that you're changing those on different weeks or not the same day. So I'm not going to put someone on a treadmill and ramp them up on, you know, hills and resistance and speed all in the same day. We're going to go through that slowly and again to make sure that they're less likely to experience a pain flare. And also you want to uh, make sure that your patient knows like, hey, I want you to be successful with your aerobic exercise plan several times before you increase so that you know, right, that you were successful. And so maybe if you do have a flare um, from, you know, after an exercise bout, it's not consistent with your other previous. So they don't lose confidence in their ability to exercise. Okay, and then of course, uh, we've talked about exercise as becoming almost befriending exercise as a new coping tool. But what are some other non pharmacological coping tools? Um, there's been some research looking at fibromyalgia and osteoarthritis uh, for TENS units. So, certainly um, having a TENS device um, can be helpful when someone uh, is experiencing pain flare. And so, those are the devices that I will recommend to patients that they can use at home, right? They, could, they don't need to go somewhere to use use it and they can usually put it on themselves pretty well. Um, and then relaxation strategies are also, also something that we'll cover briefly in clinic. This could be something like diaphragmatic breathing, a progressive muscle relaxation, guided imagery. And these are, um, are all evidence-based strategies. If someone's having a lot of difficulty relaxing, or maybe they have a condition that makes it difficult for them to relax, then I might send them um, to pa the pain psychologist to specifically explore more relaxation tools. Um, and then there are also self-massage tools, and especially right now um, with, you know, again, promoting independence and confidence and, and self-care tools, uh, things that they can use at home. Um, there is some research looking at, you know, massage tools can be helpful for, uh, we'd call that pain pressure threshold reduction or, or in reducing their symptoms of pain, not necessarily though improving in in performance. Um, Matt, do you have any additional? Yeah, you know, I, I, yeah, I, I, I think too, I think even with this, I think it's important to kind of set expectations uh, with the patients as well. Oftentimes these non-pharmacological like, like pain coping tools, they're helpful in uh, reducing pain in the short term. There's not really anything that's magical about them. They're not going to be um, like totally curative in any way. Um, a, a lot of the massage-based therapies, they're not necessarily... Um, designed to like break scar tissue or anything like that. Our, our bodies are pretty resilient and require a lot more force than what we can put through with a, a massage, but they do induce that kind of um, hypoalgesic benefit. Okay. And there is a release of endorphins um, from the brain when you are um, doing a massage. So, so I just make sure that they, they understand that they understand the use of these coping tools and strategies um, so that they aren't expecting like a massage for a week to necessarily cure them of their symptoms. Okay. But it's, it's meant, it's meant really for short-term relief. 
And often, well said, Matt, that's really um, important to, I'll remind them, hey, you should be, when you finish your exercise program, if you're still feeling like you're, you're getting a little bit sore or you're feeling some muscle tension, that would be a really good time to use your coping tools once you finish the exercise program. So it's almost uh, pre or post exercise so that they feel more relaxed if they're struggling with their exercise program. So really timing Certainly. and educating them on when to use those tools can be, can be helpful as well yeah you know it, it could also too it can uh, uh, some of these coping strategies can actually improve um an individual's ability to actually engage in therapy like we think of the tens unit for instance um, if someone could put a tens unit on and if that's what gets them to do their therapy if i mean if the option is them not doing their therapy and them doing the therapy with a tens unit i'm i'm okay with that and mm -hmm. um Certainly, we'd probably want to get to the point where we're we're not <laughs> having to do therapy with the uh, tens unit, but that is all um, kind of, I guess, uh, graded exercise in a way. <laughs> that could be kind of a a grading where you would wean off from something like the tens. Certainly, we don't want to necessarily grow any sort of dependence on um, these external devices. Okay, so just to recap, what will your patient experience if you send them to physical therapy and specifically pain physical therapy? Um, you can be assured that they'll get a lot of education, right? That um, hurt does not equal harm and that the pain experience is not necessarily equated to tissue damage and to be on, I certainly understand when they do need to listen to maybe necessarily like swelling would be also a good indication to maybe slow down, but that pain is can also be more of like a false alarm sometimes. And Matt mentioned the car alarm metaphor as an example of this. This often um, is key to um, start before engaging in their exercise program. Research shows that the pain neuroscience education often helps patients stick with an exercise program. We're going to address fear avoidance. We already talked about all the active interventions and exercise is a very key component, um, improving their tissue and activity tolerance, and then certainly introducing some coping to school tools so that they can manage flares at home. So we hope that you found that these were helpful. We've got a list of the references here um, of all the studies that we went over and uh, hopefully you feel a little bit more confident, confident about starting to engage your uh, patient and get them on an exercise program or at least educating them on the benefits or restarting physical therapy so they can um, improve their quality of life.